You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Captivate and on Patreon. You can get bonus content of our show on either of those platforms or on Apple Podcasts with a private subscription to the Amazal Ministries Podcast Network. Exodus 35, 10, and 19 in the Christian Standard Bible read, Let all the skilled artisans among you come and make everything that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tent and covering, its clasps and supports, its crossbars, its pillars and bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the curtain for the screen, the table with its poles, all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand for light with its utensils and lamps, as well as the oil for the light, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, the entryway screen for the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grate, its poles and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the hangings of the courtyard, its posts and bases, and the screen for the gate of the courtyard, the tent pegs for the tabernacle and the tent pegs for the courtyard, along with their ropes, and specially woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary, the holy garments for the priest Aaron, and the garments for his sons to serve as priests. Here, Moses is having the children of Israel prepare the tabernacle in the way God commanded. We see everyone working together for crafts, tailoring robes, and decorating the worship area. Even though we no longer are under the law of Moses, as Christians, we believe aesthetics can play an important part of worship still. Dr. Link, why do you believe God had the people of Israel put so much into the decor of their worship area, and what can the church today learn from that? So a couple things about the text you're reading. This is right after the golden calf, and you have an Israel that has um, that is being moved by God's Spirit to build a place, a temporary place for man and God to dwell together. But God doesn't need the work; they need the work, and their obedience to God's word is what allows them to God work in them and through them um, to to accomplish what what they really desire, which is a place for man and God to. Uh, to live together, right? So this is taking us back to the garden. That's what we're trying to create is a closeness with God. Uh, so the end result for me, and maybe for you, is that these intricate details are part of what Exodus chapter 25, verses 9 and 40 say. The tabernacle is a picture of heaven on earth. Mm-hmm. What happens when God and man come together? You get the problem of man's death and God's presence. But you get something more than that. So the tabernacle is, is, is as itself is, that they're going to build is is a teaching tool. Every aspect of it is designed to teach about what do you need for man and God to come together? You need a sacrifice. But that's also what we were taught to wait for in Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. After a ram was provided, there is a longing for what Abraham actually said, that God will provide the lamb. So Genesis twenty-two fourteen 14 says, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And so it is that lamb. And so in some way, the tabernacle depicts God upon earth. It depicts the lamb of God. And what it does is invites people to take part in what God is doing, not because God needs our work, but because through his, through working for the things that he has asked us to do by obeying his word, he spending time with him by his word changes our hearts. So the church is the gathered assembly with those same kind of priorities in place. God doesn't need us to gather. We need him so that he can use us to to uh, to make himself known, to glorify him and so forth. And so all those details of the tabernacle are, let's be honest, when you read them monotonous, but every aspect of them ties to this larger picture of what Moses saw on the mountain, what we're anticipating will come in the end of the days. Hey guys, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast. I am Joshua Knoll. As you can tell, this is still part of our ecumenical aesthetics series. We have a couple of very special guests today. Um, My former professors that we have had on a few different times, I, I guess that they're I'm, I can say with confidence, they're the most common former professors to appear on <laughs> the show. Um, Dr. Peter Beck and Dr. Peter Link, uh, 
two of your your favorite Peters. <laughs> Guys, uh, welcome back. Thank you for joining. Um, Dr. Beck was my uh, professor of like theology, systematic theology and historical theology, I think we did as well. Yep. Um, New Testament. And Dr. Link was my old professor, Old Testament professor. <laughs> Sorry, old professor testament. Yeah, <laughs> you know, same things. Um, I'm younger than he lot. is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And of course, of course, you know, many kids dream of one day meeting a dragon seeing the monsters from our great fantasy stories but the dragons from these stories dream of meeting the one the only our co-host tj tiberius on blackwell how's it going it's good thanks yeah um so well i urge you to check out the honors on ministry podcast network website uh the link is in below you can check out other shows like this that we have here and you can get merch on the store to support the show if you don't feel like seeing a bunch of other podcasts in your feed. But that's always great. And we have the merch link in the show notes as well. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you all know, if, if you've been here ever, if you've ever heard this show, that I have a favorite form of unity, a, a great spiritual practice of silliness, where I like to ask a silly question. TJ and I answer <laughs> first, and we'll let our guest answer later because it's impossible to truly be and in, in, in division when you're being as silly as I occasionally like to be. So we'll start. Um, TJ, which scripture do you think, what, how we're going back to this, would make for the worst Van Gogh painting? We've done this question before. We sure we have. got it again. Yep. You want me to change it up? Because I've thought of a different one that I thought oh, would be sure. better. Okay. Which of the Psalms of it, if any, you could use a hymn instead. Would you most like to hear SpongeBob SquarePants sing? You go first. <laughs> I go first? Yeah. Um, I want to hear him do Psalm 119. <laughs> the whole bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think that'd be great. <laughs> I think Psalms 106 would be great to hear SpongeBob do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Which one's that again? SpongeBob singing about uh, innocent blood. Uh, <laughs> Sacrifice yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. 106 is kind uh, of a long one. I don't remember at all. Let's go with Dr. Beck this time. Uh, Dr. Beck, which psalm are you uh, you having SpongeBob do a rendition of? Who's SpongeBob? SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scooby-Doo. You could choose Scooby-Doo instead. I'll let you Bro pick brother. your artist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Oh, my. I almost feel like we're committing heresy here, if not blasphemy. <laughs> I'm going to take the easy cop out, and I'm going to say Psalm number one with Scooby, mm -hmm. because at the end, it is a rut row moment when you realize <laughs> you are not the tree growing by the streams of water, but in fact, you're in trouble, which is why you need the Messiah in Psalm two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, good rut row at the end. Does sound a lot better than that. That, that would not work there. <laughs> No. Uh, Dr. Link, SpongeBob or Scooby, any of the Psalms or hymns uh, you can think of. <laughs> so, um, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Even the actor mm. who's doing SpongeBob, um, <laughs> the voice actor, of course. Um, I have seen the, the musical SpongeBob SquarePants performed by some high schoolers. Really? Um, that does sound entertaining. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I do have some reference points. I have intentionally never mm. watched the show because it hurts to see even about mm. 30 seconds of it. So because I need to keep it short before mm. Scun SpongeBob hurts me, Psalm 117. Mm. That's the fair. shortest That's one. Yeah. It's very short. There you go. I actually, my pastor growing up was a huge SpongeBob fan. Just random thing put out there. He's been on the show before, Pastor Gary Atkins. Also, before we go on, I forgot to mention in the intro, Dr. Link is joining us with um, earbuds that have limited battery. So if he just suddenly stops answering questions, you guys can guess why. <laughs> yeah. 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 We did not there excommunicate him mid-recording. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> He's still here, just yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. one of the main reasons we're doing this series is because of our belief that beauty can bring people closer to God and to one another. So we have a few questions that we're asking everyone in the series to go along with that belief. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us of a time where you've seen God in the beauty of creation outside? Uh, Dr. Link, we'll start with you. 
Well, the short answer is that everything you see outside is intended to be a reminder of God's beauty in the creation. The rising of the sun, the setting, the stars, the moons, the trees, um, your wife, all those things are reminders of uh, of God's of God's beauty. And that's exactly what the Psalms say, and uh, Psalm 19 in particular. Um, it's one of the, the two key or three key Torah Psalms, Psalm 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 119. And they direct us to recognize that uh, the whole creation, if we will have a heart for God, if we allow the scriptures and God's spirit to kind of direct us, we will see God's presence across the creation according to the scriptures. So, um, yeah, I would, I mean, in a practical sense, when's the most amazing time? Most people would say sunsets, right? Um, that's not a bad answer. I mean, there are some good sunsets. Uh, but uh but yeah, you see, you see God uh, working in all sorts of things. Uh, some of the the most beautiful. So so bottom line, all those sorts of things. So the, maybe the sunset is a, is a great reminder. But you could also say, um, this would be kind of odd, thinking of beauty, is when you recognize you should have died in a moment and you didn't. Uh, that can also be a rather um, in context uh, mm. moment. There you yeah. Go. yeah. All right. What about you, Dr. Beck? Any particularly beautiful moment? I usually use one of two illustrations to kind of talk about this, especially in light of Romans chapter one, where Paul talks about the, you know, the creation reveals God's hidden attributes. But the one that strikes my mind right now is I remember one time, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, probably before some of you were born, I was flying westward to Salt Lake City to go skiing. We were flying at night. Back then, the planes weren't always full, so you had plenty of room. And as we were getting close and we were getting our descent, I looked out the window and looked down and I could see the mountains and the snow at night. It was, I mean, it was, it was light because of the snow. Mm -hmm. Then I looked upward and it was so dark outside. You could see millions and millions of stars. I mean, growing up near a city, you don't see that. And I just remember being in that airplane struck by how (laughs) small I really am in comparison to the universe around me. And if that's yeah. the case, how mu- great must be the God who made all that? And so mm. a very humbling spiritual kind of moment sitting on an airplane at 30,000 feet. Mm. I like his answer better. I like that. <laughs> we'll go with his <laughs> answer. That's a good example, though. I, um, yeah. You know, while, while I'm thinking about it, <laughs> you remember the, either of y'all know there's like a, a C.S. Lewis quote where he says something about that, that verse in Romans, but he said – if all he had was nature to go off, he would have thought that God was a cruel, terrible God or something like that. Do you know what I'm thinking of? Because he's talking about the, like, quote, the no. cruelty We're of nature. You're making it up, but go on. I might be. I might be. As I was just know. curious what your thoughts of were <laughs> were on it because it was always a weird one, but I might so, be misremembering, I guess. So this to me is actually key because we're talking about the relationship between special revelation and natural revelation and mm-hmm. and we have these discussions of natural theology and so forth. And this is Dr. Beck's area, but I'm always fascinated um, when people um, I think miss the fact that part of what enables you to see nat- natural revelation properly is spending time in special revelation. I mean, the scriptures really give you a grid that you would not come to on your own. Um, and there's limits of course, in, in the aspects to both of those. And we'll let Dr. Beck uh, 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 chastise my answer here. But I, I think that's actually a very big part of why spending time in the scriptures, particularly in the concept of worship, uh, is such a big deal. Because you will not have the mind of, of Christ, the mind of God, uh, but by the word and spirit upon your heart. Hmm. Dr. Beck, are you, are you going to criticize? <laughs> is, I wasn't he- at all. I was just, you know, <laughs> I agree. I think it's why we do emphasize the need for special revelation that, you know, the hidden attributes of God that Paul talks about. Clearly here have to be issues like sovereignty, not just create. I mean, yeah, he's a creative God. Look at all he made. But when you realize how small you are or how powerful a storm like a hurricane can be, it is meant to remind you of how infinite that being, whoever it might be, is and how infinitesimal you are. And so I think it is meant in one sense, not only to strike on the minds of a believer who is amazed at the beauty of what God has created and drawn to him more, I think part of it is to drive the non-believer to the realization that they're nothing in comparison and begin the quest to look for. The problem, of course, is, as Paul says, and Isaiah says it as well, the person who sees that ends up instead worshiping 
the creation rather than the creator right. instead. Back mm-hmm. to your topic, they create something visual that in their mind represents the infinite instead. Mm-hmm. And as always, you go back to Mount Sinai to think about the relationship between fear and faith. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> it, it, the world is a terrifying place. Um, in Israel, at Mount Sinai, they are afraid of death and God's presence, and they, they don't want to go up. But what do they ask for? They ask for God's word. They ask for God's word to become Moses' word, and that becomes a way that they can transition from a bad fear of God, a fear of death in the creation, uh, to um, a fear of God that also loves them, which is where you get the Shema when Deuteronomy 5 re- reshapes it, um, or explains it. I shouldn't say reshapes. But so, yeah, I, I don't. I have no doubt that that the fallen world uses suffering and death to shock us to our uh, limits and in so doing point us to something that is unlimited that is ultimately God. Hmm. Yeah. It's funny because I I think I found part of that quote. (laughs) So so I was trying to look for it. It's it's, C.S. Lewis was talking about like his argument from when he used to be an atheist was more of that kind of line of thinking of like, this world is so cruel and unjust. Even if you take humans out, just looking at nature, it looked cruel and unjust. But just having that reference of cruel, actually, now that he, like, once he became a Christian, he realized he wouldn't have a reference to think of something as cruel unless there was something truly good out there, which, Correct. yeah. Lewis is so he, does make that, he does make that argument repeatedly yeah, uh, uh, across different uh, works. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my misquoting of Lewis aside, <laughs> sorry, well, just a little side tangent. It's fine. Would you both mind sharing a moment with us if you have one that you have felt a special connection to a painting or something like that, whether religious or not? I uh, yeah. I'll throw this one to Link first. I think I made, I made Beck go first last time. No, you made you made me go first, but I'll go oh, first again. My bad. So um, I can't even remember the name of the painter, but it, it's one I actually use in class, and it's Abraham <laughs> slaughtering Isaac. So um, I, I now I can't remember wow. who the artist is, but it's but it's a really great uh, portrait. And then I use another portrait, but it's important because it shows a really, to be honest, pretty solid understanding of the tensions in the text. And, and the fact that a, a mm-hmm. still painter can do that is is pretty uh, I, I don't understand art well enough to be able to to tell everything. But I, but I know enough to know that that's that's a great a moment that's captured and in, and it what's interesting though is it becomes a moment distinct from Genesis 22 in a sense while it's talking about what's going on there his own per, or his own perspective certainly shows up uh, uh in the midst of that and that that is part of responding to God's word when you when you communicate God's word when you pass it on to others um uh, you know can you do that faithfully i think that painting on balance does and i, I wish i could take mm-hmm. it i don't remember now whether it's rembrandt maybe it's rembrandt i don't know is it it's one of the yeah. masters. I want to think it's maybe Van Dyke, but I know which painting you're talking about. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And and hmm. so I contrast it because because what he does is is you've got two paintings side by side, and in in this one he it's emphasizing his obedience, and so you've got the angel having to stop his hand, and where in the in the corollary painting you've got him pulling Isaac close, and he's the hand is away, and, and so. Um, Anyway, the point is, is that the tension of Abraham's choice between loving God and loving his son, how they come together and point to um, the uh, not to the ram, but point to the city in the background. And the city lit up in the background is meant to be Jerusalem. So Moriah is uh, where the temple is going to be. And, and that's that's what's going on there. So it points oh, yeah. to Jesus ultimately. Yeah. Hmm. If it's the one I'm looking at, that man. That's yeah. That's a crazy painting. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's, it's, yeah, it's probably think about more... talking about visual media. You just can't help but try to find it to see what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So here's Josh yeah. googling during your lecture, just like our students do today. <laughs> just like Josh, so I, I, he was getting. I it. noticed during my first answer, he was looking up whether a C.S. Lewis quote was right rather than listening to me. And this one, I mean, I'm looking for I'm the listening. Painting. Dr. Link, according to Google, you're wrong. Would you go ahead and answer again? <laughs> I, I, I have had people assert that I'm wrong oh. many times, actually. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not answering that today. <laughs> Dr. Beck, uh, same question. Do you have any painting or anything that you've really had a connection to that you've seen? Well, like a student, I'm going to disregard the question you ask and answer the one <laughs> I want to answer. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. 
Hey, teachers but do I think that a it still lot relates too. to the topic of aesthetics in that mm-hmm. music also has that yeah. ability, right? You know, the old so. cliche, music soothes a savage soul. When Solomon is wigging out, they have David play to calm him down. Mm-hmm. And I'm reminded of, you know, you asked for a particular incident, personal. I remember it's been 15 years. My wife and I drove to Charlotte, went to a concert at a little beautiful venue up there. And I'd listened to the artist. We had him on, you know, iTunes or whatever. But hearing it in person, and it was not a Christian artist. This is a secular jazz artist, plays trumpet. Hmm. But as soon as he hit the note in the uh, famous opera oratorio, Nisam Dorma, it cut to the soul. And I'm not an emotional person. I don't weep. I don't cry. I don't get goosebumps, you know, at Hallmark commercials. But I remember sitting there in that theater with, you know, 3,000 of my closest friends thinking, holy cow, I just had a moment because of a sound of a note. Mm. And I think that's what art does to us, whether it's music, whether it's visual art is, you know, you watch an athlete who's an artist at their sport, all of them kind of stop you in your tracks and make you go, this is an amazing world we live in. And again, does it point us to Christ or does it point us away from him? In that case for me, even though it was secular music, my first thought was, you know, if this is what it's like on earth, what must right. heaven be like when the heavenly music opens up? Yeah. So the, the Messiah chorus, in a way, always does that, especially when you attempt to sing with it, right? <laughs> uh, because you're, you're, the words are so scriptural, number one, and it's just overwhelming that such a beautiful s- statement could come mm. uh, over and over. I mean, just beautiful. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that music is certainly something that um, mm-hmm. can deliver God's word in a powerful way. Yeah. No doubt about it. Far less sophisticated, but equally emotional moment, I think. I know we're all superhero fans, but even thinking of like people like to discredit a lot of the Marvel movies as like art. But that moment in uh, Spider-Man Far From Home where Andrew Garfield gets to save the love interest in the same kind of scenario that he lost his own, I was like, oh, that that one hit. I was like, man. Anyway, moving on past superheroes. <laughs> so which uh, which one is Andrew? Which one is Andrew Garfield? Um, the amazing the Spider-Man. Amazing there's Spider-Man. like five Spider Man. The one in, the in between right? the two. <laughs> okay. You see the curly haired guy? Yeah, a little. No. Maybe. Okay. I don't know. All right. My my kids know uh, that. I get all that confused. So. It's yeah. a little curly. Yeah. No, I just had, we had gone. I forget how many years it was between those, but it was like he went from like in his universe, his love interest died at his hand on because he was trying Correct. to save her. But this time he was able to actually save. Yeah, it was, sure. it was cool. Yeah. For me, I like I really like um, parallelism like that when something's like mm-hmm. repeats, but ends in a better note the second time. <laughs> um, anyway, it has been shown a lot of different studies show that there's a healing aspect to seeing beauty. Um, and this time I do know that I made Dr. Link go first. So I'm going to make Dr. Beck. I'll make you go first. Do you believe <laughs> that there's a reason why God might have wired our bodies and brains this way where perceiving beauty can actually have a healing effect on us? There's a couple of ways you get, I could kind of go about answering this. We could talk about, you know, theological concepts of anthropomorphisms that God condescends to speak to us at a level we can understand because we wouldn't understand him at his level, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to explain the infinite with finite words, but kind of come out of a slightly different direction. So I don't sound so, you know, technical here. I think God has created us this way in his image, right? The image of God. I mean, even the, even the language is visual image, Mm -hmm. you know, we're images, we're image bearers. (laughs) And so I think part of this is a reflection, no matter how minute we might be at it, of what God himself is like, Mm -hmm. that he is beauty. He is beauty embodied, if you can use that kind of phrase to talk about a spirit. Mm -hmm. But he is what is beautiful. His his Mm -hmm. actions, his behaviors, his desires are all beautiful. And so he's created us in a way, whether it's by the ear or by the eyesight or by that visceral feeling that we can in some small way begin to understand or maybe better yet appreciate this Mm. sublime beauty that again, with my analogy earlier, if God can make a storm this powerful, what kind of God must this be? Mm -hmm. If we can begin to appreciate beauty, even in a small way, it points to the fact that there is a greater beauty available for us. And so, you know, David talks about, you know, Psalm 27 verse four, 
One thing I long for, and that's to be in the temple and sit at God's feet and gaze mm-hmm. and ponder at his mm-hmm. beauty as he teaches me. And so I think we're made this way so that we can begin to re- understand who he is and enjoy his greatness. So what's great about that answer is, is the implication there is that all beauty is eschatological. All beauty mm-hmm. has its ending in God. And in our encounter with beauty, as flawed as it is, is part, just like suffering and tragedy and all these other things, it's part of God's way of of connecting the now to, to what will be. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that beauty fades, right? And we redefine what beauty is. I mean, one of the problems, you, you can tell the idols of a culture by how beauty is defined. Like right now, female beauty, in our there's one category of female beauty in our culture, and it's being hot. Well, I got to tell you, that's not a very enduring category of beauty. I'm in my mid-50s, right? So what you, what you find beautiful over time, hopefully is maturing as a Christian in the gospel and aligning with that. But that experience of beauty, I think Peter's right, man. It is... It is a God-loaded, anticipation-loaded, um, eschatologically filled uh, hope. And so beauty and hope are inseparable if we are doing this according to the scriptures. So I, I think it's a great answer, Peter. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's you think actually, that's why kids heal faster? Because it's so much easier <laughs> for them to experience beauty? I, I feel mean, that I, You know, what, what interests me, because you, you're talking about like some of like the secular world stuff yeah, is like thinking of like our, and this could just be because everyone always feels this way and is grumpy about their own culture. Maybe, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm thinking like a lot of times mainstream beauty in our culture seems really vain, which maybe it's always been the mainstream like that. But I'm thinking of like Socrates, obviously very secular, but when he talks about like the virtue of beauty, a lot of the things he says, I'm like, that's some um, pretty close to what I might say about God actually. <laughs> It's very sure. weird. Well, you know, the early church apologists, you know, would make those kind of arguments to their culture despisers, as H.L. Mencken would call them, you know, who were mm-hmm. against Christianity. You know, the apologists would say, no, but look, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle are on to something. They just have mislabeled it. Mm-hmm. That, right. You know, you've yeah. all heard the cliche that, you know, all truth is God's truth. That's an mm-hmm. early apologetic method. And so, you know, when we talk about, you know, why is their beauty different than our beauty? Culture changes, right? Look at Roman art versus Greek art versus, you know, Mm -hmm. modern art. You know, go to the Noma in, you know, D.C. You're going to go, oh, you know, the National Museum. No, I forget modern art. You know, the perception changes, but it's that constant quest for beauty. Yeah, that's right. And the constant, you know, either this is beautiful or it's not beautiful. Is this instilled, inborn desire to identify what is ultimately good and beauty is just one other way of categorizing that problem is you know as the bible warns us one day will come with all you know call to themselves people who will tickle their itching ears and what was once good is now called evil and what once was evil is now called good you can even see that in art you know i've never been to italy you know it's kind of on my if i had a bucket list i'd love to go see michelangelo's work Mm, you know, I went to yeah. art school years ago. I don't know if you knew that. I'm, you know, I'm a trained artist. That's cool, though. I'd love to go to see, you know, his statues. And I'd love to be able, and they won't ever let you do it now because of the world we live in where <laughs> nut jobs are breaking statues in museums. I desperately yeah. want to be able to reach up and touch the David or the Ooh, Pieta. Because yeah. what he was able to do with stone is amazing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's but he's true. drawing the beauty out. And so I think that quest, back to your question about, you know, why is there, what's this healing aspect? Again, music has the ability to heal. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why people with children with autism, sometimes it's the music you play that helps them focus mm-hmm. or whatever. Again, I think it's just, we are designed by God's will to pursue what is good and right. Mm-hmm. And music fits that for, for us, or the art mm-hmm. touches on that nerve just a little bit and maybe begins to heal mm-hmm. the broken or the, the emotional wound, you know, a lot of people, music is their coping mechanism. You're having yeah. a bad day, go put on the headphones, put in the AirPods, you know, listen to Bocelli sing, you know, some beautiful piece. Mm. It's healing, but it's healing because yeah, it's right. beauty. And again, that beauty is drawing us hopefully heavenward to the God who is the source of the beauty. Mm. Yeah. Right. I promise my last C.S. Lewis reference, at least for a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, Surprised by Joy, that book. Yeah. You know, a lot of that is like, you know, he has these moments of just the smell of a fresh cut lawn or something. And it just triggered something in him or that like deeper mm -hmm. joy. And that's just like when you talk about just getting like a tingle, a sense of it, that's what I'm thinking of. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've, I've read this before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and what you said about music, this will seem really strange. Stranger Things season four. Hmm. That is the way that you uh, protect your. For those who haven't seen it, just you know, just just trust me on this. I'm going it's, to haunted house about that soon. <laughs> yeah, um, but it is interesting because my my point is even the secular world understands that hmm. there's something embedded in art that is um, touching of the soul, touching of what's really enduring. And um, when you have the character Max running hmm. and she's listening to a mediocre eighty song. Um, you still have a sense of it's that beauty of music because remember they they contrast that with the scene where they figured that out right at the insane asylum and that was the way they ministered and comforted people and I think if you're going to think about you know um, aesthetic and art and so forth there is a great comfort in finding beauty um, and there's also a sense of I need this to endure right um, mm. both of those things are true. Mm. Well, and that's, that's why we're repulsed by ugly, right? Whatever your perceived understanding of ugly is, you see, an, we, I mean, we talk about it. When I was yeah. a medic, that's an ugly wound. You know, no wound is good, but some are worse. Mm -hmm. And so we're repulsed by ugliness. You know, right. sin is painted, so to speak, in scripture as being an ugly thing mm. so that it becomes less attractive rather than more attractive to us, you know. Mm. I know that ultimately you guys, Josh and TJ, want to go somewhere with the conversation, but <laughs> you know, I think this is a good point to remind us yeah. that historically, since the advent of the church and the influence of the church in Western culture, particularly for say a thousand years, from roughly Ambrose until really just past the Renaissance into yeah. the early modern era, it was the church that provided the art for our culture. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Even down to the buildings that brought inspiration and awe when you walk into those eight great cathedrals in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now we've abandoned our position as the definers of beauty. And now all we do is very often complain about it. You know, we used mm -hmm. to set the standards, Handel's Messiah, Christian music, mm -hmm. right? You know, Michelangelo working for the Vatican, doing artwork that we still talk about 700 mm -hmm. years later, 600 years later. Now Christian music seems to imitate secular Christian art has taken on secular tones. Mm. Christian movies. I mean, how often do the Christian movies either come across as very poorly doing, they're not really art, or the ones we think are art is because we've emulated the artistic style of our secular counterparts. Mm. And so the church has lost that sense of understanding what is beautiful and also the sense that this is part of our gospel message. Let mm. us communicate to you beauty and tell people what real beauty is. You know, it's not an abstract piece of art with a toilet on the floor going, ah, oh, this is life. It's a toilet. You're right. It is a toilet, but we have the answer to it. Let me show you instead what's beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what's great is, is, is art is ultimately conveying a story in some sense. And all stories find their, uh, find their grounding in the reality of the ultimate story. And that is uh, ultimately for us, Christ crucified. And uh, it's inescapable um, that uh, beauty for us is going to be connected to um, mm. sacrifice. So I have one of my children who shall remain nameless. I have five. <laughs> this this son does not like to watch people dying and suffering. And it just, it really, it like, he gets emotional about it. And he had to read this work this week where the red fern grows. Oh, that's and so that was, horrible. A, <laughs> it was traumatic because he's a dog lover too, a major dog lover. He comforted himself with the dog. Anyway, all, all that to say is, is that you have, um, you have this sense of sacrifice being necessary to demonstrate actual beauty and love. So when a mother gives up sleeping and cleans diapers and all that, those are just small little sacrifices, but they're that actually becomes the vehicle in a fallen world of showing love and affection for somebody else. And our, uh -huh. and our stories ultimately are going to value that which we think is most beautiful and most loving. And the sense of sacrifice becomes clear. So when I'm always wanting my, my son to watch war movies, one of the things I've tried to do is to tell him, hey, when you see that man dying, that man is dying because he loves his brothers. 
Mm. And that that is where we can really have a gospel message. Uh, real quick, how do you feel about Band of Brothers, the HBO series? I've not yet seen it. I finally have access to it. I love it. So maybe I'll watch it. The problem is, is I the language is too intense yeah. in most of these shows. But um, you know, we've got uh, ways to deal with that. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, no, no, I, I, I love war movies, but I've never been in war, so I'm, I'm kind of like a a third rate critic of an Ooh. actual war movie. Speaking of Andrew Garfield, a second time. What's that? Uh, that's like, oh, man, that's one of my favorite war Talking movies. About Hacksaw what Ridge. Am I thinking of, TJ? Yeah, Hacksaw Ridge. That one's good. I think it's on everybody. Now. Everybody loves that one. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So before we get into the more <laughs> unique aspects of this episode, uh, we have another segment that we're doing in each episode for the Ecumenical Aesthetic series called Artists' Corner. Uh, I have a few questions to pick from. I'll be doing them in a random order. I might only be doing one uh, because we have seven minutes to discuss whatever we want here. <laughs> so if we can answer all of them in seven minutes, that's great. But if we talk about one for seven minutes, that's cool too. So does your church have any statues that we could discuss? Dr. Beck? No. Next question. Dr. Link, does no, your church have any have... statues? All right. No. Uh, no. <laughs> that, that would cause a revolt. So. Yeah, that was cheating. Yes. <laughs> You pick so the easiest what, question. <laughs> yeah. So what kind of wall decor is around your church and what is the significance of it, Dr. Link? So um, to be honest, it's uh, vision casting mostly. Um, we have, for example, um, make disciples who make a difference is the way we kind of compress the, uh, the Great Commission statement into something practical for folks. And the primary way we do that is life groups, which is what I lead. Um, and I'm in charge of the literature we do for that, along with one of my colleagues here. Um, so we have stuff promoting that. We have stuff uh, talking about uh, missions. And so what you really do hopefully see is something that uh, invites you into those aspects. But is there artwork? No, not really. Um, there's certainly no statues and there's no stained glass. Um, but is, so it is a more modern church feeling. Uh, by low church, uh, free church standards. Uh, but yet still, you can, even in what we do put up, you can see at least what we believe is our number one understanding of, of what is going to make us a beautiful fellowship. Hmm. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Beck? Walt the court. Well, again, we, we don't have art per se either a lot. I mean, I'm trying to think walking through the building in my mind, you know, children's Sunday school rooms have Bible story pictures, you know, just hypothetically Jonah and the fish or whatever. But even the one piece of art that I think that we have is a picture of an eagle flying, but it's a quotation from Isaiah. And so Mm. on some of the older adult rooms, you know, there's scripture verses that are stenciled on the wall or whatever. So again, it seems to be word driven rather Mm -hmm. than visual driven, if you will. Yeah, that sounds about right. I I would say, you know, if I thought about I was thinking about the entry for your area. If, I mean, if you go into our church, we do have an aesthetic that attempts to to make everything look nice and neat and orderly and some mm-hmm. some things. Um, we have the Christian imagery of the cross and the baptismal waters behind that. Um, so those are the major priorities, the cross, the baptismal waters and, and, the, and the lectern, um, which is really a podium. Um, but those are the those are the primary visual things you see. And visually, as far as the appearance of all of us, we're all dressed in a way that relates to the community around us. I'm actually probably wearing something like this many days, um, but I only preach a little bit. So, but in other words, we're pretty casual about it, but that's part of the, the visual imagery of it. Hmm. Now, so uh, what is the most unique piece of art that you have ever seen or heard, Dr. Beck? Oh, wow. Big question. Yeah. Yeah, that one's, that one's tough. That's broad. Yeah, I can go. Piece of art seen or heard. Yeah. Uh, Again, I've been to a number of art museums. I'm personally Mm -hmm. fascinated by older art, the Greeks, the Egyptians, some of the, Mm -hmm. what you might call classical art. But again, just off the top of my head, the piece that, you know, maybe takes my breath away again and thinking musically, Mm -hmm. whether it's like Mm -hmm. we said, Handel's Messiah. There's a song, again, from the, the, the opera, it's called Turando or Turndot. The song is Nisan Dorma, but you know I've got it three or four different versions on my phone on iTunes. One's the trumpeter, one is cellist, 
and then one is a, an actual opera singer. And my wife and I both commented the other night when we heard the opera version with the lyrics in Italian, my wife said, can you play the other ones? We played the other one. Can you play the other one? And at, we both agreed, you know, unanimously, the spoken version is better because mm. even there, the voice is the instrument, right? right? But all of a sudden now I can relate to the voice and the story behind it is also one of those, if you know the story of the song, like, you know, the story of a movie. And so mm. that may be also part of it, TJ, is I know the story. The story is about a beautiful young princess that everybody wants to marry, but she's cold and mean. Mm. Suitors come. She, they want to propose to her. She won't. They have to pass a test before she'll even look at him. The guy comes. She doesn't want to see him. They propose the answer or the test. He actually answers the question correctly, but she refuses to see him. In fact, she orders her citizens kill him. And he says, tell you what, I'll let you kill me if you can't answer my question. Hmm. And he poses the question before her, you know, who am I? What's my name? Was basically the gist of the question. And she ponders it all night. And in the morning, it dawns on her as the music is uplifting and swelling. He's willing to die for me. And she goes, your name is love. Hmm. And then she can't kill him. And so there, there's your piece where all the elements are coming to you. I can't imagine what it looks like in a the theater, but just musically, <laughs> it swells yeah. and swells till there's, hmm. it takes your breath away. Hmm. Yeah. All right. What about you, Dr. Mike? So unique. I don't know how to um, describe unique. Um but from a, a broad sense in art, I'm a movie guy. Um, and I, I would have to say um, there are, are many movies, like um, many movies that I enjoy that certainly would not be unique. It would not be special. But I think when Becky and I saw both the theater and, and the movie version of Les Miserables. Oh, yeah. Um, that for us was... First off, seeing it, even in even when the actors didn't understand the gospel, it was so clearly a gospel book. And I and I jokingly tell my students, well, you know that uh, Les Miserables is a commentary on the Pentateuch, the conflict between faith and law. And they all look at me crazy. And then I begin to explain that to them, and they mm -hmm. and they begin to see it. But the, there's so much in that movie that just, um, especially when we saw a live uh, theater production of it. Um, that that just brought the two of us uh, to tears. So that's I don't know if that counts as unique. I mean, it's so it's so well seen now, but but it is something that absolutely was art that touched the soul with the gospel. Yeah, yeah. I saw it at the Blumenthal. It was really good. Yeah, it's really good. I'm kind of a, I love Lemis. I'm kind of surprised that uh, neither of them sent the outline back to me marked up with "Hey, this word's too vague" and <laughs> circled. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, I, I think. I don't know. I don't. I never got to answer this question. But the most unique piece of art I've ever seen was a, a song, kind of a series of albums written to kind of show the progression of Alzheimer's and what that's like. Oh, weird. Uh, so it's six albums, which total about seven hours long. And the first one is normal ballroom music, something you know that sounds kind of antiquated from back in the day, and then each album it degrades further and further until it's clearly familiar and still nothing like what you know it is hmm. and that is a really really great uh project called everywhere at the end of time that's uh, everywhere at the end of time pretty unique. yeah if you have like seven hours to kill uh definitely <laughs> check that out also if you enjoy les misral and and really thick books you got to read Victor Hugo's works and keep in mind that he's Catholic. It's mind blowing. <laughs> Cause like, so yeah. So I actually, as a lost person at the age of 22 in my fourth semester French class, we had to read extended mm -hmm. excerpts from Les Miserables in French. That's the only class in college I made a D in. Uh, but oh. uh, so it's kind of ironic that it became one of my stories <laughs> long before it was a musical. Uh, but that is one of my life goals: is to sit down and read through all of Les Miserables in French. But it it probably won't happen. Man, but I would like to I would like to make that a beautiful goal. That would be yeah. cool. I think his best book is Hugo. I love clocks. That's <laughs> funny to somebody my age, I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> but that is about seven minutes. Uh, so, man, who was um and Les Mis? Who who is the the priest that's in the Bishop Muriel in the beginning? 
So who's the actor yeah. and yeah. the movie person? No, I was just so trying that, to think of the name. I answered my own question. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Well, I was going to say, what's interesting about the movie version is the actor who plays the priest, as I understand it, and the original Broadway production actually played the main role that Hugh Jackman's playing. Oh, that's um, So I don't know that, that, because I have the soundtrack side by side. The names are the yeah. same. Um, and, and so whether that's true or not, it's, it's a, it's an amazing uh, production in the, uh, so either way, it's good stuff. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, uh, one of my life goals is just to somehow become the exact kind of man that that Bishop was who mm. got like two lines in the movie, but was like a few hundred pages in the book, <laughs> you know, no biggie. Yeah. That's but it, but it, it's as an opening, it, it sets well, yeah. up the whole story. It is, it is oh, yeah. a redemption story. That's paid for with a price, and you know the priest is just this vehicle to make that happen. And then once his work is done, though his character metaphorically is no there, his character metaphorically dies. Um, that's what gives life to Jean Valjean, and then Jean Valjean passes on that life to um, to his daughter, adopted daughter, obviously. And uh, it's just it's just amazing to see how those things work together. So. Man, yeah. Okay, so moving on to like some some of the more unique questions we had for you two specifically, um, and I might c combine some of these and just you know whatever. Um, I, I noticed we, we were talking earlier a, a lot of our biblical texts. You know, we're thinking of like the Exodus we read earlier, going through like Daniel. We have a lot mm -hmm. of emphasis on the robes the priests wear, the stuff that's in the temple, how it's built. I feel like. Even though we'll still mention it, a lot of times in our more evangelical churches, we don't really talk about the importance of how the building is built or, you know, what we wear, that kind of stuff. It, it seems like it's more of a niche topic, whereas it takes up a lot of space of the Old Testament. Why, why is it like that? Why do we not spend more time on these passages? So, so Peter, is this the Puritan influ influence? That and I think part of it's the Puritan influence. I think part is just the reforming approach. You know, that yeah, all of us right. Protestants, even some of the higher church ones that do have cathedrals, are often Catholic cathedrals that they <laughs> took over. They didn't yeah. build them; they got them. Is just you know that we often identify ourselves by what we're against, not what we're for. Mm -hmm. Correct. I think that's part of it. I think there's part of it theologically that. In the Protestant movements in general, but particularly the, the free church movements, the lower church evangelicals, we don't have a theology that requires a priest anymore. The priesthood is over. I mean, that priesthood is over. We're now all considered, you know, priests under God, according to Peter. But, you know, as a Baptist, I don't need a priest. Christ is the great high priest, mm -hmm. and he's made the sacrifice once for all. So I think there's theological reasons. I think there are practical. We don't want to be those guys. We're intentionally not doing that. But same token, I think not that necessarily for the clothing, but I think some of the beauty in the other church traditions has been lost on us. You know, we, we treat our sanctuaries like coffee houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and right. So that then changes how you come into the presence of God, your perception of God. You know, I used the analogy earlier, you know, the great cathedrals in Europe. I took my son 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Germany, Switzerland, part of France. And I noticed, caught myself doing it, wasn't doing it intentionally, that whenever we walked into a new building, a new cathedral, that I would audibly gasp. And I realized because mm -hmm. he was looking at me like, what are you doing, dad? And it was just the sheer, you know, the roof of Notre Dame is 150 feet over your head. <laughs> you know, it's not LED lights 15 feet up. It's drawing you heavenward, you know, our old yeah. steeples that we've taken off most of our new modern churches. The steeples point you heavenward. <laughs> so there are theological reasons why we don't do some of these things. I think there's some just we're, you know, rebellious. We're still pro protesting. <laughs> yeah. But some of it, I think, has also been to our detriment that we've lost a sense of that reverence and awe that when you come into the presence of God, does it stop you in your tracks? Do you realize it's with Moses, you're on holy ground? And so some of it is maybe a, a loss on our part. Hmm. Yeah. So, so it's almost as if in mastering the horizontal aspect of what we're trying to do and because people create, especially in our, our, our setup, they create genuine 
relationships, discussions. I mean, there's edifying going on, not just in teaching and in life groups and not just in the sermon. There's a lot of that going on. But there is a se- there is a lack of sense of awe. Uh, there is a lack of a vertical relationship. And so one of the ways I think our tradition recaptures that is how we handle some of the things that church has always done in, in terms of how we read God's word. It becomes very important to me that the sermon is essential. The sermon is is bringing out, it's exegeting, and it's it's explaining it's it's the, the text. But just the reading of the text needs to probably be more elevated because that is the bridge between heaven and earth. The, the, the scriptures are the face of God. They are heaven on earth for us. And, mm-hmm. and so to me, I know that's something that I try to emphasize. The way that we do the Lord's Supper, uh, the way that we do baptism, these things are reminders of not only the the horizontal dimension of our lives, but especially the vertical dimension of our life we have in Christ. Um, and I think sometimes in our desire to be real and genuine, genuine and authentic, that that uh, can be lost unintentionally and not necessarily. Um, but on the other hand, and the other traditions where you just go through the motions um, on that vertical relationship, you know, what? How how are you making disciples through that? How are you... It's almost as if for this thing to work, we need the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Right? Mm. We, yeah. we need God's grace to bring those things together. Mm. So yeah. wh- why do we think so many churches today seem to focus less on this kind of imagery in our worship? Is it just because we're rebelling still and we don't want to be associated? I kind of feel that way. I think there's a sense of rebellion and identity in what we do and Often people will say we're a non-liturgical church, but every church has a liturgy. There's a liturgy for what you do as a group, as, as a church, but there's also a liturgy to your private life. Liturgy is a much broader term. Um, it, it's also people are drawn to the liturgies they already know. I don't know think that anyone's actively rejecting as much as or some are, but in general, uh-huh. I think this is this is what we've done the way that we've done it. Um, and that's why pastoral leadership is so essential in terms of um, help uh, the, the leaders of the church, the elders of the church, uh, they really need to think through whether or not the, the particular liturgy we're walking in is connecting us to these greater issues or whether it's become an obstacle. Mm-hmm. And to, re- to, neg- to neglect um, the historical traditions we've received would be foolish. Uh, we, need to, in, we need to have a broader conversation and think about um, often what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what... Um, are we are we truly being faithful and making disciples through how we're doing it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there any things in like the Old Testament visuals that really stand out to you that you're wish maybe we did focus on, like as far as like robes or just how the building is made? Because I know we mentioned earlier some of that all without the. So that's interesting to ask. I mean, I was raised in a very liturgical tradition. I became mm-hmm. an atheist at sixteen, though. And I rejected that, so I'm I'm not I'm not sure I'm the best one to answer that because <laughs> yeah. Um, while I respect the beauty of it, um, at the end of the day, if God's word is not being emphasized, um, that that beauty is is rather shallow. Yeah, it's 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 the appearance of of holiness without its its uh, its substance. Whereas if you handle God's word well, um, and you connect it to uh, all the elements of worship, then you're, I just happen to think that that's a far more beautiful thing. So as far as the Old Testament, and I mean, I'm really glad that there's no sacrificing of animals. That's, that's number one. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. um, <laughs> yeah. But, but as far as the, the priestly attire, I mean, um, I, I, you know, even, even the priesthood in, in the more liturgical traditions does not look like Aaron's priesthood. And that's, that's, that's yeah, intentional because good. yeah, Aaron's priesthood is not meant to be the solution to, what Moses is describing here. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's a pattern and it's a pattern that points towards a greater one. And um, it's very fitting to me that Jesus physical appearance is not described by the gospel writers. Probably the most yeah. effective um, description of Jesus's appearance is in Isaiah mm-hmm. um, and, and revelation is appearance is described metaphorically. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know that the, th- that what, that changing the clothes of pastors would would accomplish exactly what you want there, but there is a sense that yes, we're often more driven by our 
culture's view on what attire should be mm-hmm. rather than um, trying to at least ground our ideas in the scriptures. I think that's fair to say. I don't know what the conclusion should yeah. be. Yeah. That's a, uh, yeah, I don't either. So we'll leave that there. <laughs> uh, um, I'm, I'm going to throw this next one to kind of TJ and Dr. Beck. Um, I'll let TJ, I'm going to throw this to TJ to throw to Dr. Beck. There we go. It's going to be an alley-oop. Um, <laughs> one of the things I find interesting that you do see in some evangelical churches, as far as like imagery that's still used are church flags or the Christian flag. Um, I know the church that I grew up in, the church TJ is still a part of, does actually have a church flag. I was informed that I was incorrect about the Baptist church having a church flag or the Southern Baptist convention. Anyway, they just, they, some churches will use the Christian flag, but TJ, you want to tell us some about uh, the church of God of prophecies flag and throw this to Dr. Beck. Yeah. So the church of God of prophecy actually has had a flag since it was founded in 1933. And uh, the flag has kind of been with the denomination the whole time, which the nomination itself was an offshoot from the Church of God of Cleveland, Tennessee, which if you're listening and co op and don't like Tennessee, sorry about that. We're all kind of <laughs> just yeah. down the line. Uh, but the Church of God of Prophecy flag itself is a, a red flag to jo- symbolize his blood uh, with two blue lines on it to symbolize his purity and two opposite chevrons to represent his uh, blue. What is what is blue? His wisdom, I think. Sounds and right. uh, I had it pulled up a second ago. I can find it again. <laughs> blue is his truth. The the opposite chevrons represent his truth. And between those and the lines in the middle of the flag are in purple a scepter, a crown, and a star, all representing Christ in some way. But a scepter. Did I say serpent? It's a scepter. Definitely not a serpent. I think you said scepter. <laughs> yeah, I get them confused sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that flag has been associated with us for the past uh, 90 years. And mm. yeah, 90 years. I'm not very good at math. <laughs> but uh, in some areas, it's actually a lot more closely related to our church than others. Uh, in some areas, the Kogov is actually called uh, the Church of all nations, which is named for the flag. It is the all nations flag. Uh, Mm -hmm. That is not here. And I've Mm -hmm. never heard anyone call it that, at least not to me, but allegedly. You just know it is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So do you feel like having a church flag can be a tribalizing kind of thing? And how would you respond to that criticism of having a church flag? Beck. Also, what's the Christian flag? Note the caution (laughs) as he proceeds forward here. I personally, this is my personal convictions, struggle with the use, existence. I understand biblically that, for example, in the Old Testament, there is a reference to God as my banner. And so there is this idea that this thing, you know, leads Mm -hmm. you. It's like they followed the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan into the Promised Land. But in terms of, you know, I think of practical matters like, you know, the Christian flag, the one you all have seen with the white the main thing's white, blue with a red cross. It's only about 100 years old, 120 years old. There's actually a pledge that goes with it, which, mm-hmm. again, makes me kind of, you know, start spasmodically going. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Baptist in me. That's the one who, weird. you know, we want separation of church and state. And I'm going, we don't need a, a Christian equivalent of a secular thing. Mm-hmm. Then there's also the, you know, the ex-army ranger in me that says, you know, if you're going to have a Christian flag and you're going to have an American flag, by American flag protocols, the American flag is supposed to be higher. So is the flag mm-hmm. higher than Christ? And for some evangelicals, we come pretty close to sounding like we almost want to believe that. So part of me is a very pragmatic, practical approach. Is let's just do away with it and eliminate all these discussions. Mm-hmm. That said, my church, when I got there 11 years ago in the sanctuary, there's an American flag in one corner, Christian flag in the other. When we've done Vacation Bible School, they've used it as part of the Vacation Bible School program. Mm -hmm. Perfect world, if I was creating my way of doing it, we wouldn't do those (laughs) things. Mm -hmm. I think the key will be, and I think Dr. Link used this earlier, is to use those sort of things, again, as discipleship kind of things. You Mm -hmm. know, TJ describing his church flag. You talk about the Christian flag. 
we could go so far even as the American flag. And there's one somewhere in here in my office over my shoulder. Most Americans don't know what any of those things represent anymore <laughs> in the flag. Yeah. What are the red? What are the white? Why are there X number? Why is the blue field this particular side? Mm -hmm. They don't even know it's a, a field. And so I think if we're going to use such things, mm -hmm. whatever they are, whether it's the art, it's the stained glass windows, we need to be more intentional about communicating what they are, why they are, and the value for them. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we just miss that. And so mm -hmm. we assume everybody in the building knows what that flag is up in the corner of the stage. And the problem with assumption is when something is assumed, you eventually quit saying it and then eventually it's forgotten. And then it becomes what he was saying earlier. It's just what we do because that's what we've always done. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, in light of some of the modern debates about so-called Christian nationalism, I would suspect mm -hmm. some Christians would want to remove any flags from their sanctuary because our banner, if you will, is the cross. Mm -hmm. But of course, in the early church, they didn't even have crosses in their sanctuaries. The identifying mark of the early church when they finally started building buildings was the baptistry. Mm. You walk in, this is how you know you're in a Christian building versus a secular marketplace. They've got a baptistry. And of course, mm. then you get into the drama of the sacraments or the ordinances. Yeah. You know, buried, raised a new life. It's a drama every time you do baptism. The Lord's Supper is a drama. This is my body broken for you. This is the blood poured out for you. Right. Even, you know, it's a drama that I think portrays part of what happened with Moses going up on the mountain to meet God and they had a meal before they ascended the mountain and all that stuff is drama. But unless we explain it, it's just a painting on the wall. It's just something else we do that's lost on people. I think this is why in America, we so readily burn American flags now. And, you know, and people were shocked, you know, 20 years ago when the whole debate, should we outlaw burning flags? Some of the younger generation go, why are you all so upset about this? It's just the flag. Talk to the greatest generation. It's more than just the flag. And so right. if we're going to keep these kind of things, we need to make sure our people actually understand them, mm -hmm. make sure they don't become idols, like in Hezekiah's day when they were idolizing the bronze serpent. But if there's a value to it as a tool to communicate the gospel, let's use it. Mm -hmm. But if all it is is something in the corner of the sanctuary collecting dust, it's lost any value to us. Mm, right. And in the case of the flag, it's a man-made invention. It's one of those things that we don't have an explicit command to do. And so the question is, according to the regulative principle, should we do it at all? Yeah. Um, at the risk of TJ strangling me, I'm going to expand your idea a little bit. Because <laughs> um, I know we have to get going. But... I, I think some of the times we hear the flag and it almost seems like this is like an old conversation because you don't really see that as much. I think the same conversation applies to digital marketing. You see a lot of churches plast that logo on absolutely everything. And maybe there's a meaning to their logo, but they don't talk about it. Right. It's on their Facebook banner. It's still a banner. You know, you got your profile on your T-shirt. You're wearing it out everywhere. I, I do think we, we verge on something a little cringy, maybe not. As Christian as we think, if we're not explaining some of this, um, even like our regular whole church, you know, logo, I don't post it on everything, but we did put, a, you know, we have a lot of thought into that. We have the different colors representing diversity and had to be really intentional that it's not a set of colors that mean something else in our culture that we don't want to say, you know, um, we also have like we have the olive branches. We have even the the church icon was really selective. Uh, it's not any particular church building. So no one's like, oh, they have a Catholic church building on there. So I had to like, you know, combine some um, like architectures in this simple 2D frame thing. So no one makes a weird assumption. But if we just throw that on everything, we don't explain it. I think we run into that same danger of having to flag up because, hey, this is our tribe and our tribe is cooler than yours. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to actually ask uh, quite a few people what the Church of God of Prophecy flag meant before I found an answer. <laughs> so funny. nobody was even able even able to tell me everything about yeah. it. I just eventually right. had to look it up. Yeah. Wow. That Very tells cool. us something about whether or not we should have a flag and we're going to move on. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing we are asking everybody, usually we ask everyone for a practical thing at the end of our episodes. But instead, for this series, we wanted to ask everyone Outside of paintings or statues, what's one kind of art you think people could get into that might help us all draw closer to one another 
as well as closer to God. Um, let's let Dr. Link go this time first. What kind of art? Well, the first part of the answer is good art. Uh, and I mean art that understands metaphor, comparison, but it also gets to the heart of the human condition. So whether it be music or whether it be still art or whether it be whatever, um, it's got to connect to the Bible's core claims about who God is, who we are, and the necessity uh, for a salvation in the cross. And so what that means ultimately is if you connect that to metaphor, that opens up a whole bunch of narrative worlds that each artist can, can explore and, and build out. Uh, within the worship service itself, um, I'm, I'm less excited about doing that uh, in anything that's an official gathering per se. Uh -huh. And there's a couple reasons for that. I don't want the sermon itself to be viewed as art, not uh -huh. in this crass secular sense of it. There is an artistic aspect to it, but its core mission is to communicate God directly from the text to the people. So for me, that's kind of, uh, you know, kind of dividing line here is um, what can help us yearn for God? That is a that is a biblical sermon that handles the, the, the text well, proclaims it clearly and draws people into the to the world of the scriptures. Once we move from that, when we're going on beyond just our worship service, then what we're doing is very simple. We've got to figure out how to communicate the gospel and what we say and what we do. And I think art can do that. Good art that, that has those core principles uh, that works in conjunction with the scriptural message and invites people into it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Beck, same question. So it's not to build upon or repeat what he just said. <laughs> I think without identifying a particular art form, which I think was the original question was, so we're basically ignoring your question and answering That's what fine. we want to talk about. <laughs> right. You know, yeah, you can ask all you want. We're going, you know, we're politicians. <laughs> you know, ask your question. We're going to tell you what we want to say. But I think as Christians, back to what I was saying a little bit earlier, maybe, is that we need to rediscover as a community the value of art. And part of that is the worship arts. So, you know, some churches have a pastor of worship arts. I, I kind of like mm -hmm. that language, sort of. But, you know, for example, we have people who historically don't like art museums, you know, and some Christians have shunned them. There are Christians right. who shun music, unless it's church music, or they shun movies, because, you know, all movies, not just, you know, rated R or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, could art be a way for us to communicate and connect as a church community? You know, could we have an art fair? You know, could we uh, on the, at our college campus once a year, they have essentially what's art week and they have various right. different art forms created by people on the campus, mm -hmm. not only to highlight people's skills, but hopefully prayerfully to draw people into, again, a reflection of if this is what we're able to do, what is God able to do? You know, we talk about art as a gift and talents. So now mm -hmm. you can have a conversation about the role of the Holy Spirit, you know, could we in our churches use art as a vehicle to commune with each other, mm -hmm. to encourage, to give it as a vehicle to tell stories, you know, to, to watch a movie together and dialogue? What's, you know, what's the moral, what's the biblical truth behind this? And in some churches, especially like in the big cities, you know, mm -hmm. I think Seattle, I think New York, you know, some churches have intentionally used things like art as the vehicle to reach their secular neighbors around them. Mm. With the argument being that beauty is, in one sense, while we've talked about it being very personal, in one sense, beauty is universal. Right. We, we can all appreciate this particular statue, or we can all wonder in awe at the beauty of this music or, you know, a photo display. You know, mm -hmm. can we use it as a vehicle to start saying, you know what this makes this piece beautiful? Let's talk about it rather than just criticizing or you know, snubbing somebody because their sense of beauty is not quite the same as your, oh, you like Van Gogh. He's a weird, no. Is there something beautiful in Van Gogh and can we use it as an intro mm. into a gospel conversation? Mm. If it's truly beautiful, it's always an opening into a gospel conversation. Maybe we need to do a better job mm. as Christians using it that way again. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I like that. So, yeah, no, I think that's right. So. It all comes back to how we're going to bring together the horizontal and the vertical, right? How do we, how do we communicate the scriptures within our fellowship and beyond our fellowship? And art can certainly be a part of that. 
Um, mm. And I do think particularly in low church settings, recapturing the sense of metaphor and its value is essential to recapturing the, a, a sense of beauty in the arts that will communicate without just being this cheap plastic replica uh, of art that, that anybody could do, right? Mm. Um, and so, and that's why people often don't like our quote unquote Christian movies. Yeah. That sense of metaphor, that sense of um, a story that's bigger than just um, its particular setting is, is very, very uh, key. And, and um, I hope that God is raising up lots of, 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 I presume, young people whose passion to communicate the gospel and the arts will continue to expand and grow. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So before we wrap so. up, we always like to do our God moment where we just share a moment where we saw God recently. We've all done this before. Uh, you know, we take cha- challenges, blessings, curses, moments of worship, all of that. And we always make Joshua go first. So the rest of us can have enough time to think about our God moment. So <laughs> Josh, hmm. do you have a God moment for us this week? Uh, I still think it's funny that you include curses. My God moment was when he cursed me. If God's um, cursing you, that's, you got to mention you know, it. Yeah, I guess. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to go with, I discovered uh, Switchfoot re-released their um, beautiful letdown album. And when I was, when I, when I first heard this, I was in high school and it was one of those where, Hey, this music sounds cool. It's not the stuff that's like generic K love radio. It's a little bit rock, but it's not like hard because I was never able to do hard rock. I'm just, I'm very vanilla. It was a, probably as much fringe as I could possibly handle. So, and I just remembered the music and enjoying the music. And I was like, oh, yeah, let me listen to this again. But this time I feel like I actually heard the words and stuff, you know, sitting, actually standing out of you were born to live. Have we lost ourselves? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's way deeper than just some music I liked when I was in high school. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it wasn't what my parents listened to. Um, you know, listening to that. Um, I dare you to move. Pull yourself up. Maybe redemption's right where you fell. And I'm like, oh. Wait, yeah, there's so much more there than I realized when I was a high schooler, and I'm glad they re-released it. So as an adult, that I can actually hear the words and um, realize how deep it was. And uh, yeah, it really moved me this last week. Yeah. Mm. And put the Jonas Brothers on the song. Yes, they did put the Jonas Brothers on Beautiful Letdown for some reason. That is a bit of a letdown, though. It it is, isn't it? But they did a version without them, too. So that was fine. Yeah. Which is, I, I really appreciate it. I think that's a cool way to do an album with covers on it. It's like, yeah, someone did this cover, but we're also going to put our current version on. Yeah, yeah. More that's the right to way that. to do it. But uh, for me, uh, my God moment is uh, kind of in this past week, I've gotten a lot more time than normal to be with myself and kind of get used to spending time by myself, uh, which is kind of hard to do growing up in this era where so much of your time is spent with other people doing something with other people, constantly being online, always in contact with somebody. Uh, so it's, it's challenging to learn how to enjoy spending time by yourself, I think, especially when you are my age. Uh, and so kind of going yeah. through that and figuring my way out through it with God, and it's kind of exhausting. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be all right. Because, you know, God's here and God's leading me through it. So, yeah, I think that's going to be it for me. Uh, Dr. Link, do you have a God moment for us? So it's a simple one. It's a sweet one. Um, this past weekend, we celebrated my daughter's, my third child, my, my uh, daughter Mary's 16th birthday. And to do it, we had a, um, uh, a party with uh, a, a murder mystery. And uh, this that's speaking cool. of art. And so what happened is, is uh, Mary has been had this comic book world. She's even made a digital version of her comic book with her brother uh, for That's many, many years. Cool. And it incorporates her friends. And so the, her friends who threw the party uh, developed a, um, the whole story in that world. And so I had 20 or so teenagers hanging out in our fellowship hall. And they were acting out, trying to resolve solve this mystery. Mystery, and well, the reason why it's a God moment is because as a homeschool father, one of my greatest fears is that I cut my daughter off and my sons off from fellowship with lots of folks. I always prayed about that, 
And she's kind of a quiet, reserved person. But you could see that her faithfulness in being a good friend and how God had used that and in God answering those prayers was on display where not only were these really amazing young teenagers who were doing this uh, and their their interaction with each other was very godly and, and, and wonderful. It was just a reminder that God was going to take care of my family, even if I messed it up totally. And uh, that's a reminder I needed as a husband and a father um, that that God is greater uh, than this. And he really does have good plans. So that was that was kind of an encouraging moment this past week. Yeah, yeah, that's I love the cool birthday. Wish I had one of those. I love how the uh, how closely related those two God moments were. It went from the challenge of learning to be alone to the challenge of of not always being alone. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, so, what about you, Doctor Beck? Do you have a God moment for us? It's in one sense, it's funny. People sometimes struggle with these. I imagine you all see it when you do this. Well, I don't, you know, if you have a high view of God and providence, that God's hand is involved. In one sense, it's everywhere. It's just a matter of do you open your eyes and recognize mm -hmm. it? You know, as a pastor or a professor, I can, you know, thousands of stories of, you know, I said this and then somebody came up to me afterward. That's exactly what I wanted to hear or needed to hear today. But since it's a personal God moment, I'm going to kind of piggyback off of TJ's. I'm going through some things right now without going into the details. It's another story for another day, maybe. Mm -hmm. But just struggling, you know, been, been a long year. And one of those struggles that feels very solitary and somebody I just happened to be talking to them. Hey, have you read this book? No, haven't even heard of it. They gave it to me. Never turned down a free book, right? That's correct. That's how you go to library. <laughs> I took it home, thumbed through it a little bit, said, okay, I'll read it, devoured it, read it in two days. And the overarching thought in my mind over and over was what this person was describing. I'm going, I could have written this book. <laughs> and the takeaway was, while I felt like I'm alone, I'm not alone. And in fact, I reached out to the person who gave me the book, got the phone number of the author, reached out to the author and just said, hey, you know, if no one else has ever told you this, right book, right moment in my life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It didn't That's resolve everything, but it was that sense of isolation isn't real. You know, yeah. and so that was God through Providence using what some people say coincidences to kind of say, no, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as coincidence. It's always God's providence and we need to embrace it and rejoice it when we see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you enjoyed listening to this, uh, if you listened to this, to this point, congratulations, uh, we're sending you a medal, uh, for making it <laughs> through what I think is our longest episode. And, uh, mm -hmm. please consider sharing it with a friend, uh, cousin, uh, you can share it with an enemy. If you have them, maybe this will change yeah. their mind or get them to double down. <laughs> Got to get that sorted out. Uh, there are paid subscriptions. You can support us through on Captivate, Apple Podcast, and Patreon for extra content wherever you can to support our ministry. There's some really cool bonus stuff on there if you feel like supporting those. And it helps us a lot. So please. Yeah. There's some merch. It just doesn't have our logo plastered all over it. It's mostly Bible verses. Which is yeah, yeah. better. Yeah. Uh, if you want to hear other shows like ours, you can check out the Anazal Ministries podcast, the AMP Network on Apple Podcasts or in the link in the show notes. We have a website kind of deal there. Speaking of all the solitude, recently the Clydes, another show on our network, actually talked about some of the spiritual disciplines, talked a good bit about solitude. So check it out. Yeah. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Come back next week. We'll be continuing the Ecumenical Aesthetic Series with Pastor Shana Watson of the Anglican Church. Uh, she'll join us to talk about some uniquely Anglican imagery. Then Father Jonathan Resmini will be joining us to discuss how art is used in the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition. Spoiler alert, um, a lot for a lot of things. Uh, after that, we'll be speaking yeah. with Pastor Joe Day about his experience with art in the church that he's worked both in in and out of a home church using and finally at the end of season one we're gonna have francis chan on the show yeah who is unaware so someone does have to tell him don't yeah. ask hell once yeah. he gets his invite and accepts we will end season one with him yeah the keys you huh. gotta sound authoritative yeah yeah <laughs> like i heard you're going to be on this show yeah 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 that's how my you show <laughs> yeah <laughs>
Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Again, you could always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the Whole Church Podcast or on captivate.fm or on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a one-time tip through Captivate. Thank you for listening.